Итак, я думаю, мы все-таки начинаем нашу последнюю секцию на сегодня. Секция называется «Пространство советского конструирования и освоения». И первый докладчик у нас – Ян Беренц. «Конструируя Москву. Размышления об изменяющемся символе советской модерности». So good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm sorry I'm going to do this in uh, English, but the Russian would be too bumpy and um, it make, makes more sense this way. But of course, questions in the end um, may be asked in, in, in Russian or English or any other language. Um, I think this is a really important subject and that's why I'm very glad uh, to be here. And um, instead of just reading my paper, I will highlight some stuff from my, from my paper later on. I would like to say some more general things, also maybe wrapping up some of the things that we've been talking about in the um, last uh, two, almost two days, but also um, explaining a little bit, which probably isn't really clear from my paper, um, where I'm coming from and why I am interested in these questions that are being raised at this uh, conference and in this uh, context. Um, but first of all, um, the paper is, uh, um, is a very small excerpt from uh, two um, larger projects that I was running in Berlin and I'm now running in, in Potsdam. The first is a book project with, uh, which I'm trying to finish until the end of the year, which compares um, Chicago and Moscow as two modern cities that are under-governed and trying to find uh, their way to modernity. That's where the whole that's why I'm interested very much in the term of modernity, also because it's a key term um, of this um, book um, that I'm uh, finishing at this point, uh, which deals with a period roughly from the 1890s into the 1930s. And uh, the, the second project uh, where I've uh, published on this uh, stuff is a volume, collected volume, with the title uh, Races to Modernity, again modernity, um, the East European Metropolis, 1890 to 1940. And in this case, it's not the comparison with, uh, uh, with the American case, but um, together with a colleague from uh, Belgium, Martin Kurgaard, um, we've put together a collection of essays with, uh, which uh, deals with um, um, East European cities. Among them, I mean, I obviously wrote the con contribution on Moscow. Um, but also uh, dealing with Warsaw, or Belgrade, or uh, Zagreb, or Athens, or Helsinki, so in a like, larger comparative uh, context, taking the whole um, eastern part of uh, Europe and um, trying to compare um, you know, this uh, region's way into urban modernity. Now, why might this be important for this um, conference and for the things uh, that we are actually uh, talking about here? I think, you know, first of all, this conference uh, also claims to have a um, comparative perspective and maybe one could make it even uh, bigger than it already is. And secondly, I think that um, if we really want to know what the specificities of, you know, being Soviet or Sovietness or whatever you want to call it um, are, then um, we just have to move um, not only to um, different spheres of Russian life, uh, what we've done in the last uh, one and a half days, I think. But of course, we also have to, uh, once in a while, um, really try to be international and um, compare you know, different roads to modernity, I think, to um, find out um, what might be um, specific, specific about um, the Soviet um, path. Because um, where I come from, or at my institute, I, I think, and this is why I think the um, conference is so important, you know, we, we, we sort of almost take for granted that we know uh, what Soviet means, because, I mean, um, I work in a department that's called uh, Communism and Society, and there's a lot of um, comparative stuff going on about communism in all over, uh, uh, all over Europe, uh, basically. Um, again, from the Baltics uh, to the um, Adriatic Sea, from the German Democratic Republic um, to Central Asia. And people just very loosely, it seems to me, sometimes use um, terms like Sovietization or would say things at presentations like, that looks really Soviet, without ever reflecting you know, what they actually mean by it. It's taken as something that's quite um, you know, self-evident in a way. And um, that's uh, why I um, really, um, um, really enjoy that we're trying to 
further conceptualize uh, this um, in a broader perspective, um, because I think this uh, type of conceptualization should be part, um, or is needed actually, to further historicize uh, the whole Soviet experience in its European and, if you look at the Cold War, indeed, global um, context. So coming to Moscow, do I have time for that left? A little bit, I think. Yeah, you still have um, minutes. <laughs> okay. right. Now, um, why Moscow, one could ask, and of course, um, um, all the other um, uh, subjects that we've heard about are equally important, but still I would like to make a case for the city, and we're, um, the next paper is also on Moscow. Um, because I think that the city um, is uh, somewhat of a privileged place for the study of modernity. Um, and uh, it's indeed the modern city may be read as something as, or as one of the ultimate uh, symbols of modernity. And I would argue that the city of Moscow um, um, may be seen as maybe the most potent uh, symbol of uh, Soviet modernity um, from the late 1920s well into the um, last uh, decades of the, of the USSR. I remember when I was a schoolboy and started learning uh, Russian, um, um, uh, the first uh, chapter of our Russian book uh, was called uh, Moskva Stalitsa SSSR and basically it um, talked about you know, what a modern and wonderful place Moscow was. So, um, obviously, it was a book that was also printed in the USSR, but this sort of like cult of um, urban modernity, urban achievement, I think is something that is very central and was, was quite well marketed by the USSR. And um, the city is an important place because um, we can then both uh, reconstruct discourses about the city, the way it was spoken about, but also experiences of different individuals um, within the city and again um, I would argue that Moscow but of course also other Soviet places is a privileged place because people from all over the world um, came to these places to experience something which they thought would be um, Soviet modernity and they um, reacted quite differently to what they saw in different ages you know different decades um, and I think uh, that, that is another you know uh, so there's the propaganda discourses, there's the actual experience of uh, Soviet modernities by, um, by Russians, but then also by visitors. And there's, of course, the city itself as an urban space, as um, you know, projects um, um, that may be studied. And all these three pillars, if you, wanna, if you wish, of uh, informed uh, urban research can then be connected maybe um, to a better understanding of uh, what urban modernity um, in the USSR meant and of why this is important uh, to our understanding of um, Soviet uh, history. It is also illuminating if you look at the sources because um, the sources also that I'm using in the paper are themselves always comparative, which is you know, something that we try to do in this uh, conference. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean that the the Western other, or the non-Russian other, if you wish, is always present in these sources. It just takes a different form from the 1920s into the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, but um, you know, the, the way to, to construct, if you want to take the title of this uh, conference, to construct Soviet modernity is always to construct it in opposition or uh, well, not necessarily in opposition, but in relation, I should say, um, of course, to, um, to Western modernity, um, whether this is made um, explicit or this is just implicitly the case, like in high Stalinism, where you know, at some point the West is not, not really mentioned and discussed anymore, but it's just, um, of course, uh, um, it's present in the images and in the, in the things that are perceived as, as modern and in the examples that are um, followed, for example, in the Stalin plan that would be, of course, the Paris of Osman, although they don't talk about it in the plan. It's very obvious, you know, that there are these influences from the West. So, so I think that urban modernity, and this is my last maybe introductory point before I will briefly highlight some stuff from the, from the paper, um, is, is uh, very well, uh, or maybe very well used to understand our notion of Soviet modernity because it is so much tied into uh, 
um, um, urbanistic and other um, international, transnational, if you will, discourses um, that from the very beginning, you know, we're not only talking about the Soviet experience, but indeed um, the context is always there and uh, we have to um, make sense of this comparative perspective from the very beginning. Um, in the paper I use, for example, some stuff from the uh, 1920s. Uh, there was a person called uh, Pavel Lopatin who wrote a lot about the modern um, city, um, also about um, Moscow, and um, just to highlight um, the way I think this was influenced by, by Western models, and this is quite interesting, he imagines the future Moscow as this uh, garden city. He's written several books that are footnoted in, my, in the 1920s about the future of Moscow. Um, but you can already see in Lopatin's work um, this, no, this tendency that then um, uh, becomes full-fledged in, in Stalinism um, not to necessarily acknowledge too much of a Western influence. So obviously, um, his whole visions are very much influenced, if you know a little bit about urban discourse of the time, um, by the Garden City and the City Beautiful movement, which has its origins uh, mostly in England. Um, but he would rather choose not to talk about it, but you know, to talk about the sunny communist garden as if this was some sort of like specificity that only existed in the USSR. And indeed, I would argue that you know, Lopatin and others in the 1920s put the whole urban discourse, oh wow, five minutes, put the whole Soviet urban discourse on this um, path, I would argue, to singularity, to arguing always that, you know, um, we have a singular path uh, to modernity that is so different um, from the Western path. Now, until the beginning of the 30s, although the, the picture is, of course, more complex, and you know this, the reception of uh, Le Corbusier or the whole Bauhaus um, movement, um, Sots Gorod by uh, Milutin, there the Western influences is, of course, still very much physically um, present and it only ends with the famous uh, speech by Kaganovich in 1931 when he sort of like lays down um, what urban modernity should be and should mean in the Soviet um, context and um, the um, more um, culturally inclined of the Bolshevik leadership uh, like Luna Sharsky, for example, I quote in the paper, um, uh, start their criticism of Western functionalism and um, ultra-modern uh, buildings and um, they, um, um, in the beginning of the 30s, still feel the need to, to do um, voice this criticism. While you know, as we move further into the 30s, I would argue that um, you know the um, the West is then only implicitly um, still um, still part of the Soviet urban context um, and discourse. It is not openly criticized anymore. They don't feel the need to do this anymore. But Luna Chansky also gives a very important um, catchword then, I think, for Soviet modernity, especially of the Stalin times, because he always, and others uh, too, emphasized the, the beauty of Soviet modernity. You know, in contrast to the West, where the, the Western modern city is an ugly, dark place, um, the Soviet modern city, of course, is a beautiful, harmonious, and well-ordered place, and this whole concept is then, of course, um, taken up in the general plan for the reconstruction of Moscow in 1935 that I'm sure you're familiar with the great images that are adopted here and that of course owe a lot um, to the Haussmannian ideas of how the modern city should be structured while again this is not uh, acknowledged. To jump into the post-war era because I think I'm uh, about to be cut off probably. Um, two more minutes. Um, it's it adds, I think, what, what happens in the post-war, and I've written a little bit about this in a couple of articles, is this um, imperialization of Moscow. It becomes a, the center of the post-war um, Soviet empire. It becomes, of course, the, um, the, well, one of the symbols of this empire. It, it, it is even closer tied to the Stalin cult, if you look at the text of Moscow, it is quite clear that after 1945 you cannot write about Moscow without writing about Stalin. 
and it becomes, of course, the role model, the, the whole model for the reconstruction of Eastern Europe, which in cities like Berlin and, Mo and uh, Warsaw, you can still see. So the, um, the whole idea of urban Soviet modernity, again, is not only a discourse, but you, know, you can see it in the, then in the actual buildings, if you wish, in, in Riga or, or Warsaw or Berlin or places like that. Um, it also sees the last wave of uh, um, visitors uh, that are, you know, closely monitored, like in the in the 1940s, that, that come there to actually experience Soviet modernity, and that you know, sort of like these fellow last wave of fellow travelers from Eastern Europe um, that are supposed to then return to their countries, to Poland or Romania or the German Democratic Republic, to report about the the greatness and, uh, but also the achievability of Soviet modernity as they have experienced it um, in Moscow, which of course has this uh, showcase uh, function for the world of high Stalinism. Um, of course, much of this changes after 1956. I can't go into this, but you know, there's been a lot of research in the last couple of years on the festivals, on the more open travel uh, to Moscow that we see then in the 60s and 70s. Um, the, um, um, the return to a sort of embrace of Western modernity by the Khrushchevian uh, architecture. Um, so, if you wish, you know, if you if you take um, if you go look back to the 1920s, you could sort of say that the discourse about uh, Western and Soviet modernity, in a way, goes full circle. You know, spinning away from the West, but then sort of. In the end, at least, I would argue this, um, not really being able to avoid uh, Western modernity, you know, finds itself again there uh, where it started. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for being on time. Вопрос, пожалуйста. Кристина. Where's the mic? Thank you very much for your intervention. I really enjoyed it, and um, I like the comparative perspective a lot. Uh, the fact that you mentioned this uh, uh, urban modernity, which in the end, if I understand you correctly, it's a Western uh, discourse, if I understood you correctly. And uh, correct me then. <laughs> but well, I would uh, say it's an international discourse. It can, it's an international can, discourse. can be avoided anywhere where you have urbanization. So yes. Whether and that's in the west or nowadays in the south, or you know. Yes, uh, and my question is precisely matter. about that. If you see any differences uh, uh, between the discourse and the implementation of urban modernity in the capital cities of, uh, let's say, great powers or former imperial states, and uh, in the capital cities of states that were becoming nations. Uh, you mentioned uh, some Balkan cities, uh, you mentioned uh, Warsaw. Um, so is there any difference? Do you see any significant difference in the discourse and implementation, one or the other, both of urban modernity? Uh, well, that's the whole point, actually, of the two books that I was mentioning in the beginning. And of course, the differences are different, you know, according to the questions that you ask, as always in our field. So you will get def different results uh, with different um, comparisons. And to just put this briefly, you know, um, in the whole U.S.-Russian uh, comparison that I'm doing, um, the 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 um, focus is more on the question of like undergoverned cities and in, in, in implicit comparison to European cities that then serve as a model of sort of like the well-regulated, more or less well-regulated cities, you know, places like Amsterdam or or Frankfurt or Berlin, um, in comparison to places like Chicago, New York, Moscow, or Odessa, where you would argue that you know modernity has a sort of like more wild streak in these places than. Um, in uh, Central European places that are better administered or policed, or there's less corruption, government works better. At least that's already the perception of the um, contemporaries, and uh, there's, there's a lot of things that um, we can say in favor of these arguments. But then, of course, if you get into the details, as always, uh, with comparison, things get a little bit more messy. In the second book, where we do the comparison amongst these East European metropolises, that you were mentioning. Um, I think the main argument there is that we have a sort of modernity that, that in Eastern Europe relies much more on the state as a main actor, 
Um, and, you know, and in this case, uh, the Soviet Union of the 1920s and 30s, for example, is not that much different from, say, Finland uh, with Helsinki or uh, Poland with Warsaw, where also there's a um, lack of private capital and, in a way, also a lack of private initiative for various reasons in the, in the whole urban field. And this is uh, then substituted by a very active state who draws up these great plans. I mean, there's an equally great plan for Helsinki or Warsaw. They're just not as well known because they weren't as well internationally um, marketed as there was um, for Moscow. Um, the differences between the USSR, I would argue, and, and, and Warsaw then is indeed um, only the, um, the way um, in which these plans uh, were uh, implemented, where, of course, uh, in Warsaw, you know, you had to deal with all the troubles of uh, private property, of a national government and a regional government that didn't necessarily want the same things to happen. Uh, you know, all these things that make uh, life a little more complicated. While in the USSR, of course, you had a much more centralized, um, uh, top-down politics um, 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 in implementing the plan and also resources that these other states, you know, weren't willing to use. For example, you know, in the implementation, of course, of the Moscow plan, there was a high amount of use of slave labor that, of course, you, you didn't have in, uh, in Eastern Europe in that, in that way. So, but, you know, again, the lack of resources that, all, that also hinders um, the, the, these great plans would be something that, that um, rather points to similarities, again, between these uh, cases. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna run through a couple questions quickly. Our, our topics are quite similar, so I'll save some of what I have to say for a minute from now, but a couple questions to try and move the conversation into some sort of closer definition of what would constitute the Soviet uh, as constructed in urban space. Um, you talked about this briefly now, and it's in your paper too, this sort of uh, shifting, uh, you call it a relation or an opposition, explicit or implicit, uh, but this sort of uh, specter of the West in uh, visions of Soviet urban modernity. I wonder if you could be a little bit more specific um, about that change over time. And also, uh, with regards to the use of the word uh, in the paper, and I think it was actually used uh, in the question that Christina just asked, uh, the use of the word imperial to talk about uh, the Soviet Union in general, but particularly about uh, urban construction, given that that has some style implications and stuff like that, um, how useful do you feel like that is as a, as a term, and maybe can we be more specific? Um, or, you know, is there a difference between Soviet imperial and, and uh, some of the more traditional great powers that we think of having actually had overseas empires and stuff like that? And then the final thing I wanted to ask you about, um, just because there's two sort of big clusters of it that are, they get treated a little differently in your paper, and this is a, a question that I come up with also looking at uh, Soviet aspirations in the, in the built environment. Uh, how Soviet can we say things are that never got built? Um, and here it seems to me that uh, the, the more, what we associate more with constructivism, the stuff that sort of gets kiboshed with Kaganovich in the early 30s, uh, a lot of it was every bit as much planned by the Soviet government as the 1935 Moscow plan. Uh, none of which was, well not none of which, but a lot of which was also not completed. So I guess what I'm saying is, uh, what do we do when we talk about Soviet intentions in urban space when a lot of those tension, intentions went unrealized? Well, thank you. That's um, three uh, great questions. I'm not sure I can do the one um, with the relationship to the West um, in, in, in its full dimension because it's really quite complicated and you would have to talk about you know, different sources and go into the the whole details of, you know, the relationship with the whole Bauhaus or Le Corbusier crowd, I think that's quite well um, researched. Um, but generally, you know, this whole idea that they try to, to move away, you know, this would be my argument from Western modernity, try to um, develop this discourse of an autonomous modernity. I think this is sort of like high Stalinism, you know, we have this modernity that has nothing in common with, with Western modernity, that is, the other, the good, uh, modernity, if you wish, while you have this, you know, dark side of modernity that you can then see outside of the borders of the USSR. And if you want to study the good modernity, and if you want to, you know, get there, then you have to come to Moscow because this is a, the actual place. You know, it's not only a utopia, as the discourse would then claim, but it's a utopia in the building, and and it's already been achieved at some places. 
and um, this is exactly what they tell the visitors if they, if they, um, uh, you know, send them into the Moscow metro or or uh, send them uh, to the Moscow uh, Volga Canal. Um, you know, it, it and then just turns out that of course the visitors, especially from the west, also uh, run into all sorts of problems if they, for example, go to the construction site of the Moscow Volga Canal and then they ask, so why are all these people that are building, you know, behind barbed wire down there? Um, then that is not a question that they are supposed to ask, and but you find it in some of the travelogues. Uh, so um, the, the, you know, there's always this play, of course, with um, expectations and um, the problem of you know um, not, of course, being able to produce that sort of um, um, happy modernity that was uh, promised um, actually on the on the ground, but maybe that's something very very Soviet. Um, on the imperial question, well, I think, you know, I think there's two sorts of um, imperial representations um, present in, in Moscow. In the 1930s, you have the representation, or they tried to represent the whole USSR in Moscow. You know, you can see this at Vede and Ha and other places, um, and, but also at, like, exhibitions about the, um, the uh, you know, like, Georgian weeks or Uzbek festivals or something like that. So there's sort of like what I would call the inner empire that is represented very much. Um, but um, after the war, clearly, there's an inclination um, to show Moscow um, more as this, you know, capital of the communist world um, that relates, um, you know, also to all these other countries and that is actually, uh, in a way, the symbolic uh, capital, of course, also of Poland or of East Germany or of Czechoslovakia. Um, with a, um, uh, you know, creating again this, you know, transnational discourse, common holidays, you know, these countries are also, um, for example, supposed to celebrate, of course, the, um, the 800th uh, birthday anniversary of Moscow in, in 1947. There's also celebrations, for example, in, in Poland, um, which is then a, um, a, um, a opportunity for the Poles, you know, that are just being sovietized, if you want to use that term, um, to learn to learn the discourses about Moscow and to learn you know to become sort of like an imperial subject of the of the Soviet Empire if only in the outer realm of that empire but um, I think that you, you know you find uh, you find it then in Stalin's 70th birthday of course 1949 if you look at the famous picture where he's you know with all the other leaders from the from the bloc um, you know and you, you could point to many other um, examples of this imperial dimension I think in in representation um, in Moscow.